Hi, my name is Michael Andrew, and I'm about to give you your free tutorial on the Fuji X-H2S, and I suspect this will apply to the Fuji X-H2 as well. That camera's coming a little bit later, but I suspect they're gonna operate exactly the same. I've set up a Facebook group, the link is in the description. It will allow you to review images and lenses that other users are taking pictures of. You can go to the search bar, type lens that you're interested in, and see pictures for that particular lens. I will also be answering questions there, posting resources, things that I've learned, things of that nature. If you are an experienced Fuji shooter and you just want to browse the table of contents, check out the description. We've put a lot of work into breaking these down into chapters. You can see the time code and the subject matter at that time code. You can also use your page search, which is Control F or Command F, depending on the computer you're using. Type the keyword in and it should highlight the keyword if it's in the table of contents. Click the time code and you'll jump straight to it. This video is going to cover the operation of the camera only. There's a lot of information that you will need if you're a fairly new shooter, especially to a Fuji system, or you're more intermediate trying to take it to the next level. There's a lot of information that's not covered here. Things like shutter speed, aperture, the basics of photography, depth of field, stops, composition, lighting, all of those things are going to play a very important role. This deals with just the operation of the camera. And the reason that I'm sharing this is because this is kind of like an interview is that I'm going to demonstrate what kind of instructor I am. If you find this video helpful and you like my teaching style, I would strongly recommend checking out the Fuji X-H2S and the Fuji X-H2 crash course that is in production as you watch this video. It takes about four or five weeks and in that course, I will cover the fundamentals of photography, lighting, composition. We will talk even about flash. And then I take you on location for the different shooting types, whether it's landscape, sports, wildlife, portrait photography. We do all kinds of video shooting, incredible video cameras, both of them, in terms of what we're getting. And I will take you through the advanced techniques, give you the knowledge you need, and allow you to skip the learning curve. When I got started in 2003, we didn't have YouTube. So I had to learn through trial and error and it took me about two years. And it, I remember at one point I was so frustrated, I wanted to take the camera and throw it against a brick wall and give up. I'm glad I didn't, but I say this because I wanna empathize with you. I understand what you are going through, the terminology, the symbols, You know, how do you manipulate these controls to do what I want? You can see it in your mind's eye, but you can't quite do it on the camera. I've been there, I know what it's like. This is why I make these crash courses. So if you're ready to invest in yourself, save yourself a lot of time and frustration, check the link in the description. It will take you to the product page if it's ready. And if it's not ready, it'll take you to my blog where you can leave your name and your email address and I'll reach out to you as soon as it's ready. Having said all that, we have a tremendous amount of information to cover. So let's get started. Before we get into the instructional part of the video, there's a couple things about the camera I want to point out and also about the tripod. Underneath the camera, we have a quarter inch thread and this is called a shoe. You're going to screw this in to the bottom. I, I like this particular Bogan Monfrotto style. I've been using it for years. There's another kind called an Arca Swiss plate, but I like this because it just tilts in, locks in. The ball head, I've had these some of these ball heads for 14 years and they just last. Your tripod is going to be a 3 8 inch thread and you can adapt and put different types of heads onto the tripod and use them in different ways. I like the ball head because you can unlock this and you can point the camera in different directions. It's very fast, easy, especially for landscape shooting, uh, you know, family group shots, really, really great. But invest in a good tripod. I'll be talking about these a little bit later. A couple things I wanted to point out. Uh, I took the lens off to show you some things. Is that we have a lens mount here. And we have a lens release here. Every time we change the lens. We want to demonstrate good lens changing hygiene. We live in a micro world. There's lots of dust particles. And the longer we leave this open like this. The more dust is going to get inside. So something I tell all beginners. Is when you change your lenses. Make sure that this is pointed down and you're doing it in an environment that is not windy or you know like sand at the beach kind of thing. You, you wanna be mindful of this. If you shoot long enough, eventually you will start to see dust specks on your sensor, especially at smaller apertures, you know, F11 or smaller. On the crash course, I will demonstrate the techniques that I use, 
the tools that I use and show you it's, it's not so hard if you know what you're doing. Otherwise, you can have your camera store clean it. Sometimes it's paid, sometimes it's free, it just depends on where you take your camera. But when we remove this cap, you're going to see this little red marker. That's the lens alignment marker. And you're gonna see something similar. I have, I'm using an eight, 18 to 55 kit lens for the sake of this video, because it's easier we align them together and we rotate until we hear a click. And if you've done it correctly, it will not rotate without pushing the lens release. I always kind of jiggle it a little bit to make sure it's on because it's easy to put it on there and think you have it on there and it's not really on there. So if you release the lens, again, push and rotate at the same time and it, it'll pop off. Something else I wanna point out is that the lenses we're using, most of them are gonna be XF. Those are the high-end Fuji lenses. There's also the XC lenses, which are a little bit lower end. There's also the MX lenses, which are more cinema or movie lenses. The lenses you wanna stay away from are the G series lenses. Those are for the medium format Fuji cameras. So when you're shopping for lenses, you're looking for XF or XC most of the time. Something else I wanna point out is how to figure out the filter thread size of each lens. You'll see this little filter symbol. It's like a circle with a, a line through it. And, and in this case, it's 58. So I know that this is a 58 millimeter lens thread and you'll need that if you buy filters. Uh, Maven, my company sells Filters we're coming out with this year, and this is how you determine the size. Another easy way to figure that out is just to look under your lens cap in here, 58. Let me make some recommendations on memory cards. In the case of the Fuji series, especially this X-H2 and X-H2S series, get the best memory cards you can. You're going to need a CF Express Type B card. The price on these have come down a little bit. But the reason why you want this card is you will not be able to use all of the video features that this camera is capable of without having a super fast memory card. Price on these, I think they're a little under $200 now, depending on the size that you get. Sony makes them, also SanDisk makes them. So kind of an interesting thing where we have different kinds of card slots. So again, for video features, super fast buffering clearing, you're gonna want a CF Express card, CF Express B push it until it clicks. And then on the SD memory cards, there's different kinds. And this is not one of these things where you can find one laying around the house and hope to get good performance out of your memory card. I like SanDisk Extreme Pro SD memory cards, but you'll notice that they look almost identical, but they're not. This one is far faster. This is a UHS class two memory card, and this is a UHS class one. Very hard to see, you can see it in this little symbol here, there's a one there and there's a two here. You can also tell that when you turn them around, the UHS-2 cards have two sets of pins. The main thing you're going to notice on this is how fast the buffer will clear to the card when you have a much faster write speed. So if you do lots of sports shooting, this is going to make a difference. Spend the extra money is what I'm saying. Invest a little bit of extra money and you will enjoy your investment of the camera much more in terms of you know, high speed shooting. Something else I need to point out is you're looking for these class U3 cards if you're doing 4K video. 4K, 30 frames per second, this is the minimum standard that you need to record. If you're doing 4K 60, then you're going to need something faster like this. Especially if you're doing internal recording, you know, like 4-bit 222, then you need even faster memory cards. But again, what I'm saying is get these class two cards, get the fast ones, get the extreme pro ones. There's some other brands that are fine. I'm just kind of preferential to extreme pro. And you, you also notice there's an orientation marker right here. So we just push it in until it clicks, close the door. On the batteries, my advice is always, always, always buy the legitimate brand batteries, Fuji brand batteries. There are knockoff batteries for almost every camera manufacturer out there and they're just not as good. So when we put it into the camera, we're gonna open the door pins towards the camera body until it clicks and to release obviously this orange little thing you just push in. Another thing I was gonna say, the charger that you got with the camera, it's a cable, it looks like a little box. That's a USB-C charger and it's designed to charge the battery in camera. Another recommendation I make is to buy Fuji's standalone dual battery charger. You use the cable, plug it into there, you can charge two batteries at a time. You can use a regular USB-C cable and just plug it in, but it's not as fast. So that's something to keep in mind if you're you know, using a power bank and you're just connecting it with the regular cable. It won't be nearly as fast as plugging it in with the cable provided by Fuji. Before we get into the operation of the camera, I wanna take you on a tour of the camera body 
and the external buttons and controls. Obviously on the top here, we have the power button. You can see it says on off, you rotate it sideways to turn it on and the shutter button. We'll be talking about that quite a bit. I also wanted to point out this dial here. This is gonna be your main selector dial and it's going to change your shutter speed in all of the modes except aperture priority. The lens release we've talked about. And we also have this customizable button here and we will be toggling through this as a demonstration. And as a side note, I don't recommend customizing the buttons until you're completely comfortable with the operation of the camera and you wanna do things faster. This thing right here is the autofocus assist lamp and also the timer indicator. This will come on in dark situations to help the camera focus and it'll also indicate the timer countdown. This side of the camera, up here we have a PC sync terminal. These are easy to lose if you take them off and you don't put them back on securely. You can order extras from Amazon, from different camera stores. Uh, very easy to lose these guys. This is our autofocus mode button. We can push and toggle through our different focusing modes. I'll be demonstrating that. Most, many of the lenses that, you, that you'll see will have image stabilization. That is OIS, optical image stabilization. We can turn that on and off here. And in the case of the Fuji X-H2 S series, it's a little bit different than it is on most Fuji cameras. So this little switch here, without, if, especially if you're new to Fuji cameras, this is going to determine whether it's A, automatic, meaning the camera will determine the aperture, or if we manually want to dial in the aperture ourselves. So when you see this aperture blade icon and we're shooting in something like aperture priority mode, or if we're shooting on, let's say, manual mode, this is going to allow us to change the aperture manually. When you put the camera into something like shutter priority, it's not going to change the aperture. That's just the way the modes are set up and I'll be talking about that more later. I love Fuji lenses, especially the XF series lenses. They're very well designed, they're very sturdy, they're sharp, they're wonderful lenses. This particular lens is an 18 to 55. You can find them on eBay all day long for several hundred dollars in their brand new list price. I have tons of Fuji lenses and I'm using this one because it's a little bit shorter and easy to demonstrate. You want something that you can kind of walk around and have a general purpose lens. Fuji's primes are incredibly sharp and very well made. I haven't seen many Fuji lenses that are lemons. They're just really, really good. On the side of the camera, we have a number of ports and you access them by pulling them open. We have a full size HDMI cable. This is amazing. If we are connecting to something like an Atomos Ninja 5 recorder. The full size ones are more sturdy and robust. And you'll also notice that we have, open this down here, these little circles here, these little pins. Those pins are for a cage. That little plastic weird device that you found in your box, it's basically a cable holder to prevent these cables from bending and turning. And this is where you screw it in. This is a USB-C charger. You can see the little battery icon. And again, you're going to want to use the cable on the little box that came with the camera because it'll charge much faster if you do. And then we have the microphone port. Any video that you're recording, you're going to want to use an external microphone. I'm using a lav mic, a Sennheiser E100. They're a little expensive, but the audio is great. Any audio that we record in our productions is cleaned up. So you're always going to get preamp noise of the camera, but just know that the microphone in the camera is not the greatest. And as you're handling it, those vibrations are, are picked up by the microphone. They don't sound great. So you always want an external microphone. And then we have our headset to monitor and listen to the audio as it's being recorded and also after it's being recorded. So these are the side ports. When we're talking about the top of the camera, we have a number of dials and controls. On the far left, we have the mode dial, and this tells the camera how to behave in terms of the camera exposure settings. We dial in a setting, maybe we'll have some control and the camera will do another part of that. And that is determined by which mode we're on. Usually these four, P, S, A, and M. We also have C1 through C7. I will show you how to set those up on this video. We have a video camera icon, which is for video recording, and then we have a filter mode. Something that's important about this dial is that if you push the center pin in, it will lock the mode dial and prevent it from turning. Sometimes that's confusing if you don't know how that works. On the side of the viewfinder right here, we have the diopter adjustment, and you need to pull it out before you can rotate it. You'll hear the clicking as you rotate it. This controls the focus for the viewfinder. So if you wear corrective eyewear, or you need to adjust 
the sharpness of the viewfinder, this is where you do it right here, pull it out and rotate. We have our hot shoe mount. Obviously this is for flash units. We cover an introduction to flash photography on the crash course. And then over here, we have a number of buttons. Obviously the red button is the video record button. We have our ISO control button, white balance button, and by default, this is going to be your face and eye detection button, but it can be customized as well. When we're talking about this top view LCD, we have our shutter speed, aperture, which is how wide our lens will open. When we see this particular icon, plus minus, this is our exposure compensation. This is our ISO number. This is the mode that we're shooting in. The size of the images or the resolution that we're recording. This is our white balance indicator. Here we have our film sim simulation. Fuji is known for them. In this case, it's standard. And these basically control different looks or appearances of our image. Something that you'll notice is that when the camera goes into sleep mode or you turn it off, this display changes. We can see the memory card that we're recording to. In this case, it is my CF Express memory card. You can tell the difference because this has a little slant on one of the corners. We have the number of shots remaining. We have the amount of video remaining on that card. We have our battery life. A couple things I want to point out on the top of the camera. The view mode button will allow us to toggle different settings for our eyepiece and back monitor. We have this little light bulb icon that when I turn it on, you can see the top LCD is lighting up, makes it easier to view in dark situations. So this little indicator here is telling us the precise location of the sensor depth. And sometimes this is useful if you need to measure the distance between the sensor to your subject on certain manual focus lenses that happens, but we're very spoiled with our autofocus lenses. So most of the time we don't have to worry about that. When we're looking at the back of the camera, we have a number of controls starting in the top left, the garbage icon. Obviously when we press play and we want to delete, we press that and it deletes the image. You'll notice below that it says drive. And what that means is that when we are in a shooting mode, when we're shooting, boom, 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 and we want to change, for example, the burst, we would press the drive mode button and select it. On the right, we have this joystick. The joystick is used to move our focusing square on the back monitor, as well as the viewfinder. Pushing the joystick into the camera body by default will magnify onto a particular spot that we have highlighted. To the right of that, we have the auto focus on, which is used for back button focusing. AEL stands for auto exposure lock. Q is the quick menu. We have our directional pad, menu access, as well as kind of like an enter button. When we push this, it's like we're saying, okay. Below that, we have our back display. We also have our Bluetooth indicator. I like to call this the secondary control or the thumb control, obviously. We change our exposure settings using the front dial and the rear dial. When we open the back monitor, you're going to notice these two mounting holes. This is for the accessory fan that we can purchase, which is about $200 and will help keep the camera cool if we're doing lots of video recording. And then obviously we have the back monitor. When you first get your camera, you are going to be prompted to set up your date and time. If you miss that, you can come into the menu, the wrench icon, we're gonna to go to user setting. The first thing you wanna do is set up your area. And so we get a map of the world. This is going to set our time zone and it'll give the name of your time zone. Hit okay. Then we're gonna set up our date and time, pretty straightforward depending on the format of the day, month or year you want to use. Set this, dial this in, and we're all done, we hit okay. And that is how we set up our date and time for our camera. Another thing we need to know is that the directional pad has four buttons surrounding it. And each of these are customizable depending on how they're set up by default. And you can also change them. Pushing to the left is our film simulations. Pushing up is our metering modes. They call it photometry. Pushing to the right is the electronic or mechanical shutter settings. Pushing down is the performance boost. I like to have mine on high performance boost. And if you continue to push down, you can see that there's a number of different settings in here. Something else I wanna demonstrate is if you remember in the front of the camera, just below the autofocus assist lamp, there's a button there that if you push that and you toggle it, you're going to see the level appear. 
So this is this will also do the tilting up and down. So you can see that white marker breaking off as it becomes level to the camera. It'll blend in with the green there. And if we go side to side, if I pick this up and go sideways, you can see that it will stop being green as well. Let me turn that off. Now, I want to demonstrate the view mode button as we're looking at the back of the camera. So as I press the view mode, watch what happens. This little guy comes on and says eye sensor. That eye sensor is located just below the EVF. It's this little thing here. You can see what happens as I move the pencil in front of it. This is designed to turn off the back LCD monitor when we start looking through the EVF. It's designed to save battery life. But if we continue to push the view mode button, it's going to say LCD only, which is just this back monitor. And as we tr try to trigger that eye sensor, it doesn't do anything. Push it again. This is the EVF only. You can see the TV that's on in the viewfinder here. If I push it again, push it again. We have the eye sensor and the LCD image display again. So this is going to toggle between which one we're looking at. And then we just have the eye sensor again. So if you ever bump that accidentally and you're like, how do I get my back monitor on? It's this guy right here. There's also a way we can toggle the back screen information in terms of the types of information and data we're seeing. We see lots of these icons and numbers I'll explain in just a moment. Or we can turn them off. Or we can look at some of our, our quick menu settings, histogram, and come back out to our main shooting screen. I want to check the firmware. I'm going to turn the camera off. I'm going to push and hold the display back button and turn the camera on. Let's see what we got. So we have body version 1.00, and I know there's a new version, which is 1.01. .01. Real quick, I wanted to update the firmware. This is a new firmware released. So you download a DAT file from Fuji's website, transfer it over to a memory card, and now we're going to put the memory card into the camera. I'm going to push and hold the display back button while I turn the camera on. We're going to come up to, yes, we're going to go for the body. Do you want to upgrade to 1.1? Do not open the battery cover or turn the camera off and hit OK. So if we interfere with this process as, it ha as it's happening, there can be some real problems. So we're not going to touch it. We're just going to let this go until it's done. Now that I've updated my firmware, something else that I want to do is format the memory cards just to make sure everything is playing nice and smooth. Come in down to user setting, format, slot one. It's going to erase everything. Take a picture, play. When we play an image back, we should be able to touch and drag like we do on a smartphone. We can pinch in, pinch out, zoom in, zoom out. We can also toggle the information or the display button. You get our RGB histogram. We have our Q menu, we'll be talking about that later, our EXIF data, our resolution, focal length. I switched lenses out to the 16 to 55 2.8, tells us our focal length. So we can toggle through different sets of information this way when we're playing the images back. We have a ton of other information on this back monitor, but the ones I really want you to pay attention to are on the bottom of our monitor. We also see it in the EVF. The first one that says SS stands for shutter speed. And even though this is given as a whole number, that is actually a fraction. One 320th of a second is a fraction of shutter speed. It's a measurement of time. So larger numbers in this sense are going to be faster shutter speeds. And the smaller that number gets, the longer the shutter speed will be. This little half moon indication is telling you about the front control wheel. And I want to show you something that as I continue to turn this, then we get to these whole numbers right here, 0.3, and then we get one second. And those are designated by tick marks. So when you see those tick marks, I know it's kind of hard, hard to see, that is referring to as seconds. Now, the other one, this is in regards to f-stop. Now, because I have my lens switch 
switched over to the aperture blades, I will be changing aperture here with the lens. When I flip this back to A, you can see that it's telling us the rear control wheel will now change our aperture. So what, what does aperture do? If you're a pure beginner, aperture is how wide the lens is opening. Smaller aperture numbers mean that the lens is getting smaller, the opening is getting smaller and smaller and small, smaller. Larger numbers mean that the lens is opening wider and wider and more light is coming in. These two settings on the bottom of your camera, your shutter speed and your aperture, are the most important settings that you should be aware of as a photographer as you are shooting. Very important to always be mindful of those settings and you'll see them on every camera. You'll see the same in the viewfinder. Now we have a little bit of a problem here is that our ISO is very high. Now part of the reason for this is that by default when I got the camera it was on auto ISO. Auto ISO means the camera is going to change the ISO settings depending on how much light you have as well as your exposure settings and for the sake of simplicity I want you to turn your ISO to like ISO something like 400 or 800. It's going, going to depend on where you are as you're watching this. I'm going to set it to 500 so we can see what's going on in the viewfinder a little bit. My monitor is also a little bit bright so I'm going to turn that down by coming into the camera settings, screen setup, LCD brightness. This is too bright right now. Turn this down just a little bit so we can see it, things a little bit better. There we go. So I'm going to turn this down to make it easier to see some of these other settings. To the far right of our exposure settings, we have our battery life indicator. Above that, we have DR indicator, dynamic range, as well as our film simulations. To the left of the exposure settings, this is our metering mode. This is our shooting mode, and this is our focusing mode. In the beginning, we talked about the focusing mode button on the front of the camera over here on this side, I'm reaching up, and I can toggle that to change the different focusing modes. I'll leave it on single AF. This indicator here is our exposure compensation bracket. It's telling us how over or how underexposed the image is. We'll be talking about this in greater detail later. This is our video resolution and frame rate setting, 4K 60 frames per second. We also have the amount of time remaining on our CF Express B memory card. We have the number of shots remaining at a large resolution, it's the 26 megapixels. F stands for fine, which is the compression setting for those JPEGs. Something else you'll see is this little finger. So what's a little finger touching up like this, and we can toggle that to do different things. What this is telling us is what the touch screen will do when we tap on it. And when it's turned off, you can see it's doing nothing. When it says shot, it means we can touch and the camera will focus and take a picture. If it's AF, the camera will focus only, and that's designated with the green box as well as this green circle. And it says, a autofocus off to turn it off. So AF will focus. It's looking for an area of contrast. So if it, there's no contrast, you may get a warning sign saying, hey, we can't focus on it. But once that's done, you can push the shutter button down, take the picture. I'm going to turn that off. Area is different in that we can move the focusing box, but it does not engage the camera's focusing systems. We're just moving the square around and then we can turn it off again. When I continue to toggle the back display, go to off, and then when we get into this back menu, we'll be talking about our Q menu, but we can also see our, our current focus square. A lot of the settings we've already covered. Here's our histogram, it's telling us the exposure of the image. Then we get a bunch of information here on the bottom that we'll be talking about when we talk about the Q menu. Something else I wanna show you that we can make these a little bit bigger. I'm gonna turn those on just for the sake of learning this. Come into the wrench icon, screen setup, large indicators. I'm gonna put them on LCD. You can also do it for the EVF if it'll make it easier. Let's see here. 
some of these are comically big, but this is going to make it a lot easier to see when we're doing the exposure lesson. Something else I want to point out is that when we play images, so here's our shooting mode, different sets of information, playing the image back, and then we come in to the menu button, you can see that we get a playback menu. And these are a little bit different, at least the deep menu is a little bit different when we're playing images back versus when we're in a regular shooting mode. Something else to keep in mind. I also want to show what happens when we flip our camera over to video mode. So right up here, I'm at the video icon. And you can see that we have different sets of information appearing now. Not too much different. It looks, looks like our ISO is on auto. Let's just turn this back to regular. You'll notice at the top here, we have this thing that says H.264, long GOP. So this deals with our compression format. Again, we have the amount of shooting time. You'll also notice that we get different 4K indicators under the memory card slots that we have. So where did our exposure settings go? What's, what's going on? In this case, we would press the Q, which stands for quick menu, and it would pull up our shooting mode for video. I'm going to change this to manual because I prefer to shoot in manual. We have our shutter speed here. We have our aspect ratio, white balance, our frame rate. So if I wanted to change this to 30, 29.97, which is what I usually record for, for YouTube videos, ISO, and our aperture control, right? I'm gonna do a short press. And so now I am back to the manual settings. I can see my shutter speed and I can change it. And again, I'm still using my F ring or my aperture ring on the lens. Now there is a way to change this so we can always change it by the dial and I'll be talking about that a little bit later. For now, I do want you to learn how to change your aperture using Fuji's lens control rings, which is a very, very common thing. In this particular setup, it, it appears that it, by default, it's recording to memory card one, and I'll show you how to do card management a little bit later. Now, there's a couple other features I want to point out. We have our auto focus. In this case, we're just touching on the monitor in different places. We'll be talking more, more about auto focusing later. But I also want you to see this video set down here is that when we tap this, we can access our shutter speed, our aperture, if we wanted to change it directly from the camera our ISO, we have our mic level adjustment. This is very important to see the audio levels when we put a microphone in here. I can't stress how important good audio is for video. You can see it as I'm talking, we're getting into the yellow range and if I turn it up too hot, loud and snap my fingers, now it's red. We do not want to clip out. That means we lose, we're unable to record that audio. And so I like to try to aim my audio, see where it's landing right here, just above when it starts turning yellow. Go back, back again. You do not want this auto setting, that's, that's no good. The wind filter, I've never had a lot of success with it. We have, we have our headphone volume, film simulations, white balance, image stabilization mode, which is optical image stabilization. We have IS mode boost, which I have turned off. We have our focusing modes, or we can turn off this optimized control menu. I can tap the shutter button, we're back. So we have tons of ways to access these settings. If you're looking for resolution for video in the met, you're going to go into the deep menu and you're going to come into the movie mode where we can select, let's go 4k 16 by nine. Okay. And there's tons of features that we'll talk about in part two of this tutorial, which will also be free. We cover the deep menu in part two. Tap the shutter button. It's a very deep camera. There's, there's so many controls that even if you're an experienced shooter coming from another system, very easy to get overwhelmed with Fuji's controls, customizations, and menu systems. Before we get into the mode dial and exposure control, I wanna make a side note about ISO. Shutter speed and aperture deal with real light entering through the lens. How long the recording media is exposed as well as the diameter of the opening. ISO is not dealing with actual light. In the day of film cameras, this was done with different film sensitivities. There was faster and slower films. So depending on where you were shooting, you would use film to that situation for like on a bright sunny day or if it was really dark. This idea has transferred over to digital cameras in the idea of a controllable ISO. 
This is not real light. This is an electronic gain that is added after the fact. So it's a it's a artificial boost. So at ISO 400 in lower ISOs, you get very clean images. So I'm gonna demonstrate this and you should definitely have your camera in hand, especially if you're a brand new photographer learning some of these and follow along some of these concepts. I'm gonna take a picture at ISO 400. I'm gonna play it back and I'm gonna zoom in to inspect. Look how clean this is. Look how sharp and defined the lines are on the blinds. I use blinds as a teaching method because they're great for things like exposure, white balance, color control, things of that nature. So now what I'm gonna do, tap the shutter button to return to the shooting mode, press the ISO button, and I'm gonna turn this up as high as it goes just to demonstrate the point. And you can see that it's pure white where, where it's way too bright, so we have to use a faster shutter speed to make it dark. I'll explain all this stuff in the exposure lesson. It'll make more sense in just a minute. See if we can get up to a very fast shutter speed. Take a picture. Now when we zoom in at that 51,200, you will notice that we do not have that nice, clean, beautiful blind. We have a lot of salt and pepper, a lot of grain, and it's not pleasing to the eye. That's the trade-off with ISO. The take-home message is lower ISOs are going to have much cleaner final images. And as you increase the ISO, it's almost like adding fake light. You're getting more boost to the signal, but the trade-off is it's going to be grainy. So this is something that we have to keep in mind. It, it's also going to depend on the shooting environment that you're in, how much light there is. I have a, a video on shot noise on YouTube that explains that even with low ISOs, if you're in a dark situation, you can still get grain, but it, it's something different. So when we're dealing with ISOs, that's something to keep in mind. It's an artificial boost. The higher the number is, it's almost like you're getting more light, but it's not real light, but you also get this grain problem. Lower ISOs are going to be much cleaner. With that in mind, I want to start talking about the mode dial for normal stills shooting. The mode dial up here, you're going to notice four letters, P, S, A, and M. So the easiest way for me to explain this is on aperture priority mode. And when we're in aperture priority mode, you'll notice that we get this blue highlight. That blue highlight in the aperture priority and the shutter priority mode is telling us which of the settings we are responsible for. This means that we change the aperture in aperture priority mode and the camera will make the adjustments to the shutter speed. So aperture works, very low numbers are wide apertures. When we get into these much larger numbers, like F22, this is a very small opening. It lets in less light. And you'll notice that as you change your aperture setting, the shutter speed is changing. The camera is doing it for us. And another question you should be thinking about is that if the aperture is going from small to wide and wide to small, how come the exposure doesn't change, right? What's happening is the camera is trying to keep this as an even ex exposure. So when I change the aperture and make it smaller, it's letting in more light. It's using a longer shutter speed to balance the change in aperture. And that's what aperture priority is all about. Now, I wanna show you something else that's super important, is take your hand and move it in front of the camera, just like this, and watch what happens to the shutter speed. So the shutter speed is actually changing, and I'll just cover it, because there's less light coming in. The camera's saying, hey, I'm in a situation where there's not enough light, let's use a longer shutter speed. Now we're at 1.3 seconds. So the way that this works is the camera is constantly measuring how much light is coming through the lens and it's adjusting the shutter speed depending on your shooting environment. I get tons of emails. Why is it that my shutter speed is so long? Well, usually because you're inside. If you walk outside on a sunny day, you're going to notice in aperture priority mode, the camera is going to use a very fast shutter speed. So your lighting conditions also matter. Which brings us to the all important question, how do we change the brightness of our image? Exposure is a fancy way of saying brightness. 
And this is going, going to be one of the most common things that will happen to you is you'll take a picture and you're going to want it to be brighter. The short answer is we are going to adjust our exposure compensation, which is done with the real rear thumb dial. So as I rotate it to the right, you're going to notice over here on the far left, this exposure compensation bracket, we get this half moon highlight in blue that's telling us that we control it with the rear thumb wheel. And when I rotate this and that yellow tick mark goes up, you'll notice the screen is getting brighter. I'm gonna put it to that one and take a picture. Now, when I compare those two images, that last one I just took and the one before, you will see the one I just took is brighter. So the short answer is, is that we can change exposure compensation with the rear control wheel to make our images brighter or darker. That's the short answer. And this is going to work in a similar way in the program mode, P, S mode, shutter speed priority, and aperture priority mode. I mainly want you to shoot with aperture priority as soon as possible. Now there is a long answer to this. It's gonna take a little bit of explanation. I'm going to adjust, let's see here, my aperture to get to 1 60th, okay. You're going to notice on this bracket that we have positive numbers going up and negative numbers going down. What do those numbers mean? Each number is a stop. One stop of light is twice the amount of light as the previous stop. So. When I rotate the exposure compensation thumb wheel to plus one, we have twice as much light here as we did before. And there's a way to mathematically prove this. Look at our shutter speed, 1 60th of a second. And as I rotate the thumb wheel up, you can see that the shutter speed is changing. The aperture and the ISO are not. So when I get to plus one, I'm now at 1 30th of a second. And the math actually works out because 1 60th plus 1 60th is 2 60ths, which is simplified to 1 30th. So that's how exposure compensation works. We're giving the camera instructions to cheat the shutter speed to make the image brighter or darker. So if we go in the opposite direction, let's go to negative 1. 1 125th of a second is two times faster than 1 60th of a second. It's not perfect, but it's in that ballpark. If we were to continue to go down, 1 250th of a second is twice as fast as the previous. And if you said 1 500th of a second for negative three, you are absolutely correct. So that is how exposure compensation works. Each of those little tick marks between each number is one third of a stop. So we can change our brightness in aperture priority mode by adjusting our exposure compensation. Now, there is a word of warning I have to give you, is that if you're hand holding the camera, you definitely want to have a shutter speed. If you're just taking pictures of people or things that are not moving at 1 60th of a second. If it's a longer shutter speed than 1 60th of a second, your images are going to be blurry because our hands move as we're holding the camera. As we're standing, we're swaying a little bit or our subject might move. Anything less than 1 60th of a second, you're gonna start running into problems. And in fact, I like 1 100th of a second when I'm hand holding because I get even fewer of these motion blur type images. If you are a sports shooter, it will need to be faster. We'll talk about that in a second. But if you're shooting portraits with aperture priority, you're gonna want 1 60th of a second. I can open my aperture a little bit more, let in more light, and it's using a faster shutter speed. So this is all something going to become very intuitive as you continue to shoot. Some people are surprised when I tell them as a wedding photographer, I shot tons on aperture priority mode because I'm very busy, I'm remembering names, and it's really great when you're going from a dark environment, like inside of a church, and you start backing up as the couple's walking out, and now you're in the lobby, it's a different lighting situation in that lobby, the camera is going to use a faster shutter speed. And now, oh, now we're outside and it's a bright sunny day. The camera makes the adjustment to the shutter speed and I don't have to worry about it. So if I'm dealing with a situation where time is short, aperture priority mode. If I have plenty of time, studio setting, strobe setting, I'm almost always on manual. Those are the two modes I use more than anything. Let's talk about 
shutter priority. And in this case, you'll see that the shutter is set with our front dial, it's highlighted in blue, and we can rotate it, but there is a problem here. We're getting this red indication with our aperture. What's going on? Well, let me also say that for sports shooting, you're going to want to use a faster shutter speed. Typically, I like to use a shutter speed of about one five hundredth of a second to start. Some sports vary a little bit. Small children aren't quite as fast, but yeah, human athletes, adults, one five hundredth of a second, you know, for something like basketball, minimum. You may need something even more, one one thousandth of a second. If you're doing birds in flight, you're going to need even a faster shutter speed, one two thousandth or even faster. But the very beginning for me for sport shooting is one five hundredth of a second. I inspect the images. If I have motion blur, I use a faster shutter speed. So we have a problem now. The aperture is in red. And what is happening is the camera's warning us. If you take a picture, it's going to be underexposed. That's basically what it's saying. Because you play it back, this is what it looks like. This is the camera complaining. The camera is not happy. And it's telling us the aperture, I have the 16 to 55 2.8. It's a very wide aperture. It's an amazing lens, but it is limited to 2.8. It cannot open any wider. I want you to think about this and ask yourself, if you were in a situation where you needed that 1 500th of a second and you saw this as red, what are you going to do? That is exactly right. This is why I taught you ISO earlier. We're going to bump our ISO up to the point that that redness goes away. Still not enough. Still got to bump it up. Wow. We're in a really not well lit situation. There it goes. So at ISO 6400, it disappears and you can see the f stops at f4. So we could probably use a faster shutter speed. And as we increase it, you can see the camera is making the adjustment to the aperture. So this is how shutter priority works is that we change the shutter speed and the camera makes the adjustments to the aperture. Same case as if we were to take our hand and put it over the lens. You can see it's already changing the aperture. And when there's not enough light, the camera starts complaining again. Hey, we don't got enough light. This is not going to be an even exposure. That's the heart of the matter of shutter priority. Again, sports start at 1 500th of a second. That's a good place to start. Small children, maybe 1 250th would be enough. In the case of changing our exposure, it's the same thing as before. We rotate the exposure compensation wheel. And the adjustment this time is happening to the aperture. It's the opposite of aperture priority. We adjust the shutter speed. The camera adjusts the aperture. For brightness control, exposure control, and that's how shutter priority works. Let's turn the dial to the P mode. P is a little different. It's a little wacky because what happens is the camera is going to give us different settings and different combinations. It, you can think of it as shutter priority, but there's a little bit more going on here and it's a little bit easier to use. It's sort of like taking the training wheels off a little bit. When I shoot with flash at events, P mode is great because it's the handheld flash mode. But the idea here is the camera is going to give us different settings and we can just glance at the settings and, and see if they're good enough for us, right? Exposure compensation works the same. We rotate our exposure compensation wheel, but you can see now it's adjusting it with shutter speed. And if we go up high enough, it'll change to aperture. So the summary of program mode is that we can dial in a setting, our shutter speed, and the camera can make different adjustments based on the lighting conditions, situation we're in, subject matter, and it can change either one of them. Let's take a look real quick at the manual mode. You know you're in manual mode when both of these are blue. And we're way overexposed right now. Our ISO is really high, so I'm going to turn the ISO back down. Manual mode is exactly what it sounds like. We control both the shutter speed, and we have the half moon front dial here. In the case of this particular setup, I'm using my aperture control ring to change the aperture. The camera's not going to change anything. And we dial in the ISO. It's just exactly what we tell the camera to do. It's very obedient. I typically shoot in manual when I am not rushed and I have plenty of time to inspect my images and to make adjustments as I see fit. Strobe shooting almost exclusively in manual. One of the most common questions that I get 
is in regards to auto ISO. So typically I prefer my students to dial in their ISO directly because I think it helps them learn. However, we have a setting in here called auto ISO and we get some of these other items here over here on, on the right. These are limits in terms of how high and how low we want our auto ISO to work. So let's just keep it, let's do 160 on the low end and we'll turn it up to 12,800 on the high end, come out. So what does auto ISO do for us and when would we use it in something like a manual shooting mode? Auto ISO gives the camera permission to change the ISO settings automatically without our permission. The best example I can think of is indoor sport shooting, something like MMA fighting, where you have lights flashing on and off and different angles of light. And depending on where the subject matter is, you know, as they're coming into the stadium, disco settings, certain concerts, where we have conditions where light is rapidly changing from second to second, this is where I would go with auto ISO. If, if it was doing MMA, I would dial in my shutter speed, something like one five hundredth of a second. I, I personally would probably go with the widest aperture and then let the camera deal with the ISO between those shots. This is a little high. If I didn't like this, I could come in and turn this down. 6400, tap the shutter button. And so you can see that it's not gonna go higher than 6400. It's a really good way to use auto ISO, rapid light changing conditions where we have to dial in a specific setting. These other settings in here, when I press the ISO button, so this minimum shutter speed would be appropriate when we're shooting in something like shutter priority and we want to limit the shutter speed that the camera will use. In manual mode, it doesn't apply because we just dial it in. So there is a hidden mode on the mode dial when we're on manual called the bold mode. And I'm going to turn off auto ISO. Just go back to regular ISO for now. We can pull the bold mode up by dialing our shutter speed to a very long shutter speed over, I think it's 30 seconds. So we can change our shutter speed to very long exposures. There's two minutes, four minutes, eight minutes, 15 minute shutter speed, bulb. Bulb basically means is that we push the shutter button down, hold it down, and as long as we're holding the shutter button down, the exposure is happening. And then when we release it, the exposure ends. Obviously that's gonna be a very bright image because we were just soaking the sensor with light. So it's gonna be pure white. That is how you access bulb mode. And to get back into our regular shooting, we just come back down to much faster shutter speeds. Again, we're in manual mode in order to access this. Something else that you're going to notice on the mode dial up here is that we have these different numbers, C1 through C7. We have a lot of custom modes. What, what are they all about? I'm going to continue to show you some other features of the camera, like the drive modes, the focusing mode. We have film simulations. We have electronic mechanical shit. We have all of these different settings that are great for different situations. And it's nice to not have to redial those in every time by selecting a custom position and saving those settings. So as you come in and you're changing all your settings up, once you set your camera up exactly the way you want it, including the queue settings, the menu settings, you'll notice that when we come into the menu, it tells us that we're in custom one. We want to come to the IQ tab, it's on the very top, page three out of four, and edit to save custom settings. We can come in, and save the current settings, hit OK, the camera will remember those settings as we dialed it in. Something else we can do is that we can change the shooting mode for this custom setting, depending on what, which one it is. So we have some ability to edit them a little bit in the, I think it's easier just to do it and then just to save it. It's essentially letting us edit different settings of this C1 position in the menu. Clarity, you no, know, there's so many different customizations you can do in here, it's ridiculous. We can hit back, save it. We can copy those settings. We can reset, edit the custom name for it, type in a name, pretty amazing. But the idea is, is that we can save it to a specific setting. 
When we come out, we have a couple other features, including auto update custom setting. This means that if we are in a C1 through C7 mode and we're changing our camera settings, it will remember those changes if it's enabled. And we can also determine whether or not this is a still custom setting or a video custom setting, depending on what you, you do more of. You know, if you want to have, and we have seven positions for it, which is amazing. It's really nice. And that is how we set up our custom modes. You will also notice that on the mode dial, we have this filter setting. I don't really see these as professional tools, but they're kind of fun to play with. You're going to come in to your shooting setting. Your filter setting is going to determine which of these filters is active on your mode dial. So the first one is a toy camera. It'll give you a toy camera look, a miniature look, pop colors, high key. We can't really see because we've got these blinds, but if you go out, and play around with, they're kind of fun. A little gimmicky, but that's that's what that's all about. So I'm gonna leave it on toy camera for now. Come back out to our aperture priority mode. And if we're talking about filters, this might be a good place to talk about film simulations on the back of our dial here. If I push to the left by default, Fuji's famous for having different film sim simulations. I recommend that in the beginning, just stick with the standard until you get the idea of focusing and exposure settings. But we had Velvia, Astia, Classic Chrome, Pro Negative High, Pro Negative Standard. And these are all going to give, this is very popular for filmmakers. If I press Q, we can read a little bit about it. And these are, these are definitely something you're gonna wanna take a look at. But for now, when you're beginning the camera, just keep it on standard. I wanna get into the camera's focusing systems. We're gonna start off with the basic focusing ideas, and then we're going to move into some of the more advanced focusing features. I want you to think of this in terms of how the camera focuses, when the camera is focusing, and where the camera is focusing. How, when, and where. If you think of it this way, it'll be easy. So. How does the camera focus? Most cameras by default focus with a halfway shutter button depression. I'm not pushing it down all the way. It's almost like a soft spongy resistance and you get to this kind of a hard point and then we push it down all the way to take the picture. You will also notice we get a green indication in our focusing box and we also get this green light right here on the handle. It's telling us the camera's focused. We also have this autofocus on button on the back of the camera. And by default, that too will engage the camera's focusing systems where we would push, hold, and then push the shutter button down to take the picture. It's a second way. A third way we can do this is by using the touch focusing feature where we could touch and it's telling us in green, we have achieved focus lock. And we can focus in different places. So that is a third way that we can demonstrate how we can focus the camera, three different ways. The next part of this is the when the camera is focusing, whether this is a one-time focus or a repeated focus. So the way we access these are on the front of the camera by pushing the auto focus mode button. Let me get out of this, I'm gonna turn that off and I'm going to turn that off all the way and I push that button is going to pull up the focus mode menu. Single AF means the camera is going to focus one time. And as long as you are engaging the focusing mechanism, it will stay locked. This means that we can, for example, get a focusing lock on a subject. If we hold it down, we can move the camera to make the composition more aesthetically pleasing. So we get a focus lock, hold down, recompose take the picture. Every good photographer knows how to do this with autofocus single. Autofocus single is really designed for subjects that are cooperating, like adults. It's also good for things that do not move, maybe architecture, product photography. Small kids, not so much, because small kids like to move around. Sport shooting, eh, not so much. Birds in flight, not so much, because they're moving. So, autofocus single is a one-time focus lock. The one above it, continuous autofocus, is different. This is going to focus the camera over and over and over again in real time. 
So as long as we're engaging the focusing systems, the camera is going to be refocusing. It doesn't really work with recomposing because the camera is going to be refocusing on whatever we're pointing our focusing square at. Continuous autofocus is perfect for sport shooting. If you're doing any kind of sport shooting, small children who do not cooperate, birds in flight, you are going to want to be on continuous autofocus. And I'm just reaching up and pushing this autofocus button in the front of the camera on the left side as we hold it. There is a third focusing time, which is manual focus, which means the camera is not going to focus at all. It means that we have to manipulate the focusing ring on the front of our camera in order to achieve focus. And you'll notice that as I'm turning this, our target is getting blurry. It's getting out of focus. Sometimes that can be hard to see. So there are some great focusing tools that I'll demonstrate, including taking the joystick, pushing it in to the camera body so we can get this artificial zoom on that focusing target. You can see it better. And now, as I watch the monitor and I rotate this, I know that that is tack sharp. It's a way to zoom in. Really a great little tool. And that is called manual zoom focusing. It's really good for things like videography, maybe macro photography or product photography where things are not moving and you do not want the autofocus to change. So that is the when the camera is focusing, whether it's a one-time focus or a continuous repeated over and over and over again focus. Or we also have manual focus, the three different types of focusing modes. Let's talk about the where the camera is focusing. This is a little confusing in terms of how to access it. So I'm gonna show you in the deep menu first. We have our auto focus area. Maybe we should turn this. Oh, I need to turn manual focus back on. I need to turn it back to single focus, for example. Come into the menu. And you're going to notice we have our focusing modes here in the menu if we need to access them a different way. So in our deep menu on the AFMF tab, we have this feature here called AF mode. I don't really like to use that because it's confusing with focusing mode. I like to refer to these as clusters, different shapes and sizes of focusing points. There's four of them that we see here, single point, zone, wide in tracking, and this is going to change to whether we're in a single focusing mode or a continuous focusing mode, and then we have all. So this is what they look like in the menu, but when we're shooting, we don't really see these. So I'm gonna tap the shutter button, and what I'm going to do is move the focusing square. This is how we can access it. Just move the joystick around and we can access each of those focusing clusters when it's highlighted in green by rotating the rear control wheel. So here we have a single focusing point. It's really small and really precise. Here we have a slightly larger zone and we can control more and more area that the camera is looking in for the single point. When we get to a zone, now we're starting to give the camera permission to look within this area for an area of contrast. And when we get to wide, we're giving the camera permission to find anything that it thinks is close to the camera with high contrast. Now there's something very important about this is that if you want to jump back to that cluster selection, all you have to do is push your joystick in a direction and you'll see this green frame. When you see that green frame, you rotate your rear control wheel and you can go back to a different size that you want. We are going to select the focusing square depending on the type of subject matter that we're shooting. For example, portraits, we wanna focus on the eye. And there's a better way to, to do eye focus than using a focusing square that I will demonstrate in just a moment. But for sports shooting especially, is you're going to want to select a focusing square depending on the subject matter. Like if you have a bird in flight, probably gonna be shooting in wide. Wide because they're very fast, they can be anywhere in the frame, and we want the camera to help us focus. If we're shooting something like macro photography, well then we're probably going to choose a very specific focusing point and tell the camera to look at that spot. A very common question I get is how do we tell the camera to focus in two different places at the same time? It cannot be done, that's not how it works. 
For single images, the camera could only focus on one point at a time. There are ways to kind of get around this, but I will demonstrate focus stacking and bracketing and all that stuff on the crash course for product photography and things like that. So the focusing clusters allow us to tell the camera, camera, I want you to focus right here and nowhere else. If we decide to change the size of that, then we're starting to give the camera permission to find an area of contrast in that position and to focus on that. And that is the idea of where the camera is focusing. We tell it different sizes and different positions on where to look for focus and the camera will do the rest. Now there's something important I need to show you is that let's go to a wide mode here. You'll notice that an autofocus single, like if I put my hand here and I get a focus, it's just focusing on my hand, right? So watch this. If you go into autofocus continuous and let's go to a zone, let's go into the wide area, which is really a tracking mode. Watch what happens. So I put my hand in front, halfway shutter button depression. Watch how that green square is moving where my hand goes. That is a tracking mode that only works in autofocus continuous. You will not see that on autofocus single. It's pretty good if you have a single subject on high contrast. Tracking is not going to work as well if you're shooting a soccer game because there's lots of motion in front, behind your subject, lots of moving people. It just depends on what you're shooting. And I, this is why I go through these on the crash course is I demonstrate different situations for different focusing methods. But that is the tracking mode in autofocus continuous. One of the cool features that you should be aware of is face and eye detection. By default, it's going to be set up by the bottom button just behind white balance. It's turned off now and I put a picture of myself up here to demonstrate eye detection. So when you're shooting portraits, this is a fantastic way to do it because we want one of the eyes to be in focus. So I press face and eye detection, face on eye auto. And you'll notice this little white square popping up on either of my eyes. And when I push the shutter button halfway down, we get a green focusing box that's telling us it's in focus. Take the picture. Very straightforward, very fast, easy way to have a high percentage of keepers when you're doing portraits, for especially when you're shooting one person. When you start shooting multiple people, it may become a problem because the camera won't know exactly which eye to jump onto. And then we can turn it off again by pushing this button here. We have some control over this in the menu system. Something I need to point out is that our focusing square, you, when we have eye detection, you can see it, it's turned on right where our metering mode would be. But in this case, I have a focusing box that I am moving away from the face. And when I'm focusing, eye detection is not working. This will cause some confusion if you do not know what's going on. And essentially, our focusing square that we're using should be over our subject matter. Now it's working again. So that's what's happening. Really, when you're doing this, we really want our focusing cluster to be full frame. So this can be a problem if we're doing it in a tracking mode when we're trying to use the all area, right? So what you wanna do is put this back into single autofocus. Now, no matter where we turn the camera, eye detection is locking in. If we wanna have some control, let's say you're shooting two or three or more people, for example, and maybe they're kids and they're moving around, then yeah, we would wanna go with continuous autofocus and we would want to increase the size of the focusing square and just move it over the subject that we're interested in. And that will lock the eye focus for that subject. Maybe you have a child with their friends, of course you wanna have your own child in focus, right? So there's different ways to use it. So that's something to keep in mind when you are using these squares. Big R area on does better on the continuous focus. Some of these features can be controlled when we come into the menu. Auto focus, manual focus, face and eye detection. We can go face detection on and we can choose whether we want the left eye priority 
or the right eye priority. So the idea on this is that if you turn eye detection off, it's going to go into a face detection type of setting. To get that back on, we would come in and we would turn it to auto or left or right, depending on which one we wanted, right? There it is. So another cool feature is a number of camera manufacturers have started building algorithms into the software of their cameras to be able to control what type of subject we're looking at, whether it's an animal, a bird, motorcycle, airplanes, trains, cars, just depending on what we're shooting, the camera can help us focus, but we're going to set this to off for now. And there's a couple other tools that I want that I want to show in here and make some recommendations. We'll cover most of these settings in the deep menu. If it's a feature, I demonstrate that on the crash course. Pre-AF is something that I recommend leaving turned off. If you turn it on, the camera will start pre-focusing. It'll drain your battery faster. It'll there are probably some situations where it can be useful. Autofocus plus manual focus is interesting because it allows us to get a focus and while holding the shutter button halfway down, then we rotate the focus wheel and we can adjust the focus accordingly. So the idea there is that you get autofocus first and then you could tweak with your manual focus as long as you're holding that shutter button halfway down. Manual focus assist, there's a couple really nice tools in here, including focus peak highlight. We're gonna change this to a, maybe a red color to make it easy to see. Focus peaking doesn't work with autofocus. We have to go into the manual focusing to see this. Kind of hard to see, I'll zoom in, but you're gonna see this red highlight. Let's zoom out a little bit. There it is, kind of on the shoulders and around the frame of this guy right here. So I'm pushing the joystick into the camera body to zoom in and get a closer look to this red peaking. So if I change the focusing, it's gonna change into red. So the way the idea of this is, it, is the red overlay is appearing on areas of high contrast. It's a great focusing tool if you need it, if, you, if you're having a hard time seeing if it's sharp or not. And that is referred to as peaking focus. We can change the color of it if we want. If we want something like yellow, maybe blue, come in here. And now we get this like bluish, kind of outline. Another cool focusing tool that we have is the split image. I'm gonna leave it on monochrome just to explain this. And the idea is that we get these almost like rows of gray, alternating gray patterns. You'll notice that the box over my face is in black and white. The other setting color would leave that in color. So as I rotate the focus ring, what you'll notice is the blinds in the up and down position they're not correctly aligned. So as I rotate this, when they all go into line, right about here, oh, maybe it's too far, right about there, I know this is in focus. This is a manual focusing tool. We also have the digital micro prism where the idea is that we look in this prism area, kind of like an overlay that helps us see sharp patterns. Let's turn this back to off. So those are some of just the focusing tools that we're seeing for stills. Let's take a look at the focusing modes for video. So if I take this, flip this guy over to video mode, now we're in the video mode. If I push on my joystick, I'm not getting those squares. They're not popping up like they used to, right? So how do we access the modes and how do we change them in video? Coming into the menu again, so coming into the AF mode, which is really the focusing clusters, there's only two of them. There's the multi and the area. So what the multi does, especially when the camera is on autofocus continuous, which it is, is the camera is going to focus on the nearest subject to it. If I put my hand in front of the camera, you can see it's in focus. I put it down, it refocuses on my picture. Essentially, the camera is doing the heavy lifting. It's just focusing on whatever is closest to the camera. If we do this and we put it into an auto focus single mode, nothing's going to happen until we push the auto focus on button. Any kind of serious focusing like in Hollywood, they have a person dedicated to adjusting the focus that's the first AC. So in those situations where you don't want it to change, 
you're in manual focus. That means the camera is not going to make any of these changes on its own. So the how still all applies. We can engage focusing with a halfway shutter button. Same basic concepts as stills, but we have to tell the camera which of the modes we want, manual, continuous, or single, depending on what we're doing. And we still have these other clusters that we can come in here and we can choose the area. When we switch over to area cluster in video mode, now we have the box that we're used to. We don't have all of the same size control as we did in the stills mode. It's essentially we're saying focus on this box wherever we put it. And if we need a greater area, go to that multi mode. So you can touch as well on the monitor. So when I have that turned on and I come back into continuous, the camera is going to focus what is ever in that box and only that box, right? So if I move it over here and I put my hand in, the camera is going to ignore that. One question that I'm sure I'll get, what about face and eye detection? Yes, face and eye detection, great. It's coming in the menu. Come back to multi, face and auto detection on, and there it is. If we're in the continuous, that means the camera is going to be updating the focus depending on how close the subject is. And we should be good to go. You can also re-engage it. Tons of different focusing techniques. There's a lot of other information and ways to tweak focusing. It's very deep. We will cover that in part two in the menu system. Let's talk about some of the secondary settings of our camera. I'm gonna flip this back over to a stills mode. Let's go to manual. So we wanna address white balance. We can access it with a WB button on top of our camera, push that, and we're gonna open up different white balance settings. There's a very short answer and there's a very long answer on this. And the short answer is if you're just getting started, set it to auto white balance, any of these. So we have a white priority, auto white balance, and we can come in and shift that in different color directions, probably far beyond the scope of what a beginner would wanna know. You can just put it on auto. As you get more experience, what's going to happen is you're going to get in situations where white blinds like these won't look white. They'll look blue or orange or yellow. And in those cases, we wanna move away from an auto white balance setting to something a little bit more specific. These are the custom white balances. I'll show you how to set those up in a second. We have our Kelvin white balance, which I will use to explain how this works. And then we have these icons, daylight. The idea is to match the icon with the shooting situation. So if you're in bright sun, put it onto the sun icon. If you're shooting in the shade, put it to the cloud icon. Then we have different types of fluorescent lights. I'm shooting in LEDs right now. Incandescent light, this is a tungsten light bulb. Look how blue this is, and there's a reason for this. And then we have underwater white balance where we lose lots of reds as we get lower into the water. So what's going on here? Why is this so blue? Why is this orange in these different colors? Why is Kelvin like this? So what's going on here is that different light sources have different temperatures and those temperatures have different colors. Our eyes are very, very good at adjusting to them. Camera sensors need some help. It's just a little bit too complex for a camera sensor. And these color temperatures are measured in something called Kelvin. A Kelvin temperature, I'm gonna turn, start turning this Kelvin temperature down. It was at 9,000. 9,000 looks so orange. And I turn it down, it gets really, really blue, right? So what's happening? Kelvin temperatures that we dial into the camera are going to do the opposite of the color light we're shooting in. So if you think about candle light, candle flame, that's a very yellow kind of light. And the camera, if we dial in a candle Kelvin temperature of 2600, is going to add blue to counteract that yellow light. If we were shooting in a warehouse full of blow, blow torches that are very hot, turn this up to a, a hotter temperature shooting, you can see that it's adding yellow. Think of a blue blowtorch as a, it's a blue flame, right? Really, really hot. In higher Kelvin temperatures, it's going to add 
yellow. So that's what's happening when we're dialing in these camera settings. I'm gonna come back out, swipe bounce. There's also a situation when we're shooting in mixed lighting conditions where we might have tungsten, fluorescent, LED, and they're all kind of, it's not exactly white. So we can do something called custom white balance. So in order to do this, it wants us to go right on our directional pad. Shutter will be the new white balance. So I'm gonna press shutter button. That takes a picture. We're basically saying this is white and the camera adjusts its white balance settings to this. You can use a bride's dress, a tablecloth. I used to do this all the time as a wedding photographer, custom white balance my camera. If I push set, it's going to remember it. And this is a pure white setting. That's how you do custom white balance. Something that's a little confusing on these white balances is that when we set it, the camera wants us to push to the left. Pressing OK will bring us into the different features of that particular setting. So custom white balance or whatever. I'm going to come back out. If I wanted to shift the color balance, I could do so here. I've almost never done that at all. So that is kind of a medium-ish answer on white balance and how to set it up. Most of the time, auto white balance is going to be fine if you're a beginner or intermediate photographer. And this is going to apply to JPEGs. Raw files contain all the data. It's very easy to edit and change the white balance with raw files. Let's talk about our camera's drive modes next. In a shooting mode, so as you're getting ready to shoot, if you push the garbage can button, when we come into this menu, you'll notice we have a bunch of these icons off to the left. Drive modes tell the camera what to do after we push the shutter button down all the way. The first, by default, is a still, single image. So if I push and hold, we're getting one single image. Come back in. The next one is continuous high speed burst. And you'll notice that we only have 10 and 15 highlighted here, where we have 40, 30, and 20 grayed out. That 40, 30, and 20 deals with electronic shutter. And because the camera is now set up with mechanical shutter, we're not able to see that. But if I push and hold the button down, you can hear that we get a multiple burst mode. And the buffer depth is very good on the X-H2S. If we wanted to activate these other guys, I'm gonna tap the shutter button. If you remember by default on a directional pad, the right is the electronic shutter. So we have mechanical shutter, MS, and if we select electronic shutter, come back into our drive mode, now we have these faster frames per second bursts available. Let's listen to 30. We don't hear the mechanical shutter opening and closing, that's just an artificial noise the camera is making to let you know the images are being taken. You could easily do 40 as well. As we continue to go down, we have other options, including a 1.25x crop, again, 40 through 10. And then we have a low speed burst from three to eight frames per second. Now, if I tap the shutter button, come back out and go to mechanical, you'll see we don't have all of those options here. In fact, this one's not even highlighted. Low speed burst, three to eight. And then we get into some of these other bracketing. So the word bracketing means that the camera will change something between every shot automatically. In this case, we can do ISO bracketing. That means the camera will change the ISO between different shots. We can change it here if we wanted to. This is a little tricky because as you're shooting, you don't really see it in the preview. But if we set it to one and take three shots, look, the ISO is not changing as we shoot. And then we play it back and then look at the ISO. We can see that ISO is changing between each shot. That's something to stay aware of as you're shooting. Keep coming down. We have our white balance bracketing, which is going to shift white balance between each shot. We have our auto exposure bracketing, film simulation bracketing, dynamic range bracketing, and focus bracketing. I'll demonstrate this on the crash course. It's a very useful tool for product and macro photography. We have our HDR bracketing, where we can choose between different settings of HDR. Panorama, I'll also be demonstrating this on the crash course. Really great when you don't have a wide angle lens and you wanna get a landscape shot. And then we also have the multiple exposure mode. Kind of a fun thing to try out and practice. You can also pull it off in, in Photoshop, but this is kind of a fun 
But the main ones you're going to be using in here are stills and burst and occasionally a bracket. Just keep in mind that if you want to access the electronic shutter, you have to do so from this other menu. I'm gonna tap the shutter button, come back out. Some of the other options in here include an electronic first shutter curtain. Let me give you a quick demo. Let's pretend this is our sensor. In the camera, there's two mechanical shutters. The first opens, exposes the image, and the second one ends it, and then they reset. And this happens every time a mechanical shutter is activated in front of a camera. Electronic shutter means that both the first and the second shutter remain open, and the camera does the scan electronically. And the electronic first shutter curtain means that the first curtain's up, the camera scans, and at the end of the exposure, the second curtain comes in, closes, and resets. And this is what it looks like. So that's the difference between these three, mechanical, electronic, and electronic first shutter curtain. Fuji is giving us a little bit of information at each of these, trying to tell us when to use them and when not to use them. Many mirrorless cameras today, by default, come as electronic first shutter curtain default set up. Fuji here is suggesting that this can be useful if you're trying to avoid blackout when using their cameras. Blackout is when you're using a mechanical, sometimes you'll see a stuttering in the image you're tracking because remember, this is not an optical viewfinder, it's a small TV. And that shutter is closing off for a split second and at 15 you know, frames per second, it can really kind of prevent smooth fluid motion being transmitted through this EVF, right? So the idea on this is that by taking one of the shutters out, it will help reduce that lag time. Electronic first shutter curtain is not perfect. Sometimes you will notice some strange artifacts depending on what you're doing. But for most general purpose shooting, it's, it's generally okay. Certain very fast motions, panning, some certain situations like that, you'll notice it. Just be aware it is not a silver bullet. And as we come down to these last three options, Essentially, this is giving the camera permission to be one mode of shooting at a certain shutter speed and changing over to another mode of shooting once you get faster. So if I, if I have mechanical and electronic, essentially mechanical shutter is going to work to one with eight thousandth of a second. And when you go faster than that, it'll kick into electronic. So it's kind of, these are kind of like hybrid modes. We have electronic front and mechanical with different shutter speed settings. And then we have the hybrid of all three together. So it's gonna depend on what you're doing, how many frames per second you need. Most of the time when I'm shooting and it's important, I'm on mechanical because I don't wanna risk the chance of any kind of warping or you know, jello effect kind of shooting. But there's a time and place for electronic and electronic for a shutter curtain as well. Let's talk about this guy right here, the Q button. Q stands for quick. The quick menu will allow us to change secondary shooting items. So we have primary shooting items like shutter speed, aperture, ISO, white balance. These are all the secondary items, things that we may wanna change, but we just wouldn't change them that much. You'll notice that we navigate by rotating the front control wheel. We can also use the joystick up and down. And we change items by rotating the rear control wheel. In this case, we don't get a change setting for the mode because it's dedicated on the dial. But these other items, we can change if we rotate the rear control wheel, even though there may be a dedicated button for them in the case of the focusing modes, focusing points. We have dynamic range. So we continue to go. You can see on the top here, high ISO noise reduction. So if you're using very high ISOs, you can increase this or decrease this. This typically happens with a loss of sharpness. Just be aware it's not a silver bullet. We also have our image size and aspect ratio. Large is going to be the full width of the sensor. And then as we rotate this, you can see we get different crops, different sizes in terms of total megapixels. Most of the time I just recommend shooting in large and then you can always crop or downsize in post. It's a lot harder to shoot small and make the image a larger resolution. Here we have our image quality. The difference between fine and normal is almost impossible to see. So if you're looking to save file size and you have smaller files with the same resolution, you would go with normal. And then we have raw images, fine and normal. You can also see that once we go into raw, we lose our aspect ratios, we get this yellow. Anything yellow that you see in here means there's another setting that's preventing that setting from working. 
leave it at normal for now. We have our film simulations also accessible out with our left directional pad button. We have our highlight tone. I typically do not shift this. This will tell the camera to shift our highlights and to try to recover if they're overexposed. We can increase or decrease it. Shadow tone makes the shadows more visible if we were to adjust this, increase it or decrease it. Many of these, most of these kinds of settings only apply to JPEG. And I tell beginners, don't worry about these right now. Focus on basic camera operations, exposure and focusing. Color, Fuji refers to it as color density. You can think of it as saturation. Then we have sharpness. Here we have the timer. So it's interesting that it wasn't on the drive mode. Typically timers are on the drive mode, but if you wanted to have a quick timer, this is where you come in and change it. We have a two second timer, a 10 second timer and turn it off. Here is our face and eye detection. Also have that on the top button by default. Subject detection, if you wanted to go with something like an animal, a bird, a car, a motorcycle, a plane, a train. So those are all fun to play with. It's not going to be perfect. I get emails a lot from people saying, hey, how come my subject detection isn't 100% accurate? If you're getting over 75% accuracy or even in that ballpark, the camera's doing great. Animals are tricky because there's so many different kinds of animals and, and different animal faces. So just be patient with it. Over time, the algorithms will, will continue to get better. And we have our monitor brightness, which I've turned down. Seems a little bright. And that is our Q menu. Let's talk about our camera's metering modes. These are going to be most important in the P, S, or A modes because the camera is doing some of the heavy lifting for us. The way the metering modes work is that they calculate the recommended exposure setting based on the amount of light coming into the camera. And you remember in the beginning, we were putting our hand in front of the camera and we were blocking the light. This is the same idea. The camera is measuring light. However, it is doing it by shapes of patterns in the frame. The easiest way for me to demonstrate this is to come in. So I'm, I'm pushing up on the directional pad is to come in and to go to the spot metering mode. And I'm also on aperture priority up here. Remember aperture priority, we change the aperture, the camera changes the shutter speed. Now, spot metering mode tells the camera to measure light within the focusing square that we're using, especially in the case of these smaller focusing squares. And again, we have our white blinds and I have a flashlight set up here. And I want you to watch what happens as we pan over to the flashlight. Look at how the camera settings and the recommended exposure setting changing as we get over that very, very bright light. So what's happening is the camera is measuring light from this focusing square and nowhere else. That's why when we get outside of the focusing box, or if I move the box around it, the exposure settings more or less stay the same. It's recommending a shutter speed of one one hundredth of a second because it's saying it's not very bright over here. We need a long shutter speed. When we move it over the flashlight, however, and it gets very, very bright. The camera's saying, whoa, we're, you know, this is way too bright. We've got to use a super fast shutter speed and it's recommending a shutter speed of one eight thousandth of a second. This is the heart of the matter with metering modes is that this shape pattern is going to determine how the camera measures the scene and makes a recommendation on our shutter speed. So there's some other metering modes in here. The ones that I typically use are spot, Sometimes I'll use center weighted. In the beginning, or for general shooting, multi metering mode breaks the scene up into different zones, and each zone has a different percentage that the camera uses to calculate the exposure setting. Center weighted metering mode essentially means that the camera is going to give a slightly higher priority to the center. So I'm going to move the focusing square off to the side. Watch what happens as we move the flashlight to the middle. So we get a slightly faster shutter speed, not a lot, just a little bit because it's measuring the whole scene. It's just giving a little bit more priority to the center. Finally, this last one, average, is measuring the entire scene and basically giving an average calculation. This can be useful if you have maybe backlight, you're shooting portraits or something, is where the camera is looking at everything. But again, remember, this is just for the P, S, and A modes. 
And when we have a very difficult lighting situation, the camera is highly confused, then we would go over to the manual mode and dial in our settings specifically. So in summary, metering modes help the camera determine exposure settings for the P, S, and A modes, and it does it by using different shapes of the viewfinder. If you're a pure beginner, stick with multi and start practicing occasionally with spot metering mode if you shoot into heavy backlight. Real quick, let's talk about the performance boost feature, common on most Fuji cameras. Performance boost allows us to tell the camera what to give a priority to, and it's also used for battery saving. Higher performances, you'll see this little arrow kind of turned to the right, are going to use more battery power. So any of these options that we're seeing pointing to the right, you're going to have more battery usage faster. There may come a point where you're shooting and you're down to your last battery and you're like, oh my gosh, you're right, where we would want to turn the performance lower to make sure we could finish shooting. So we get these little prompts for each of them, low light priority, resolution priority, frame rate for the EVF priority. This is kind of a quick thing that's going through. We can see the frame rates 120 and 240. And then we have our normal performance mode. We have our economy performance mode. And again, these are all battery saving when they're pointing to the left. But if you want that high refresh rate or a low light performance type of setup, you're gonna to want to select those features. I've been using high performance because I don't want the battery going into sleep mode sooner or you know, graying out. But when you turn it on economy, it's going to do everything it can to save battery life. Let's talk about lens and other accessory recommendations. The first accessory that you definitely want to get outside of your camera and your lens is a tripod. Try to stay away from the, you know, the cheapy Walmart, you know, $50 ones. Invest two to three hundred dollars in a good tripod that will last you for years. I personally like carbon fiber. I personally like Bogan Monfrotto. Those tripod legs could be four or five hundred dollars each. And then I usually get a ball head that screws into the top of it. If you're looking to save some money, there are some smaller models that work just as well, like the Be Free, for example, and there's some other brands out there. But if you're going to get a tripod, you're typically looking at anywhere from $100 to $300. And sometimes I do some research and I can find some good generic brands. If I found one, I will put the link in the description as well. But they sell out so quick that it's kind of this hit and miss thing. You know, we're talking about anything under $100. So, the advice I just give now is just invest some good money into a nice tripod. If you're just getting into video, you will need to invest in an external microphone. The built-in microphone is okay, but as you handle the camera and the lenses, those vibrations translate into sound. So you wanna get an external microphone. I recommend the Maven mic made by yours truly. That microphone came about through extensive testing. We, we did a survey of 400 people listening to different sounds and it was the number one microphone chosen. I'm very proud of it. Doesn't take a battery, it's affordable, it's very tough. You can throw it in your camera bag and not worry about it. Some of these other microphones that you would spend two or $300 for, they require a nine volt battery. It doesn't really improve the sound. They're fragile, they break. So Maven mic, if you're just getting started, if you are going to be doing Interviews like this, like vlogging or teaching lessons, or you want really high quality audio for speaking, you are going to need to invest in a lav mic. I'm wearing a Sennheiser E100 with a journeyman microphone. It's worth every penny. Rode also has a really good lav mic setup. Uh, those are rechargeable, very affordable, highly recommended if you're looking for good quality and, and trying to stay under budget. If you do any kind of landscape shooting for stills or video, if you do video work outdoors, if you're doing portrait with fills, if you're doing any kind of long exposures like waterfall, especially outdoors, you are going to want to invest into a good ND filter system. And I'm thrilled to announce my Maven magnetic line. Those are a color coded line of filters. So they're not black, they're different colors that relate to how the filters are used and they're magnetic. So you don't have to thread a filter on or off. You can swap them very quickly. I don't know where we'll be at with the pre-orders on that, but when it's live, I will put that link in the description. Let's talk about lenses, lens choices for your Fuji X-H2 or X-H2S. When we're dealing with a smaller sensor size as we are on these cameras, we have to apply a crop factor. The crop factor allows us to plan 
what type of focal length and field of view we're getting when we use certain lenses on our cameras. So because it's smaller than a 35 millimeter frame of film, we apply a crop factor of 1.5 on the lenses that we use with our X-H2 or X-H2S. A crop factor, so for example, at 1.5, you multiply it times the focal length of lens. So if I'm shooting with a 100 millimeter lens, it's going to behave as a 150 millimeter. It's just the way sensor sizes work with lenses. If it's not 35 millimeter, we apply crop factor. Most of the lenses I'm gonna recommend here are the XF mount. There's also the XC mount. You're gonna to wanna to stay away from the GFX Fuji lenses. Those are for medium format cameras, but let me give you some recommendations if you're looking to invest. Almost all Fuji lenses that I have shot with are pretty spectacular. They're all pretty good. In the beginning, you're going to want a walk around lens. There is the ever popular 18 to 55. It's a 2.8 F4 variable aperture lens. I have seen these on eBay all day long for prices as low as 400 and even less. Brand new, it's like six or $700, but you can find used ones on eBay all day long for, for much less. If you're looking for a wide angle lens, I personally prefer the 10 to 24 F4 for Fuji because I think it's a better value. I think it's about $800 brand new, but again, you can find these used all day long on eBay for a few hundred dollars less. Fuji also has an 8 to 16 2.8 that brand new, it's $2,000. I did an extensive test with those two wide angle lenses and you do get a little bit more. It's a little bit sharper, a little bit wider aperture, but because of the number of lens elements in there, it doesn't necessarily translate into dramatically brighter images. It's a long story. Suffice it to say, I like the 10 to 24 F4 more. I think it's a better value. If you're doing mid-range telephoto shooting, which is something you might want for close distance sports or you're a wedding photographer, things of that nature, a, a very versatile portrait lens, then you're looking at the 50 to 140 2.8. It's a fantastic, beautiful lens. It's amazing. The Fuji lenses are fantastic. And if you're going to be getting into sports shooting, there's nothing I like more than the Fuji 100 to 400. It's a very light telephoto zoom lens. It is incredible. I'm very happy with mine. When Fuji announced the X-H2S, they also talked about the new 150 to 600. It's a brand new telephoto zoom lens. It looks spectacular. I haven't used it yet. Very tempted to get it. That also is going to give you a significant more amount of reach. And probably the most amazing, one of the most amazing lenses I have ever seen is the 200 millimeter F2 from Fuji. It is ridiculous. That lens is $6,000, probably out of the reach of most of our budgets. But suffice it to say, Fuji makes lots of great lenses. There's tons of primes that they make. All of them are really good. They're just different costs and you're getting a little bit more sharpness here and there. But if you're just getting started, I would say start off with those zoom lenses. And as you get more advanced and you're looking to specialize, then you would start investing into primes. If you found this tutorial helpful and you're ready to invest in your education to take it to the next level without the frustration and learning curve, check out my Fuji X-H2S and X-H2 crash course. I will put that link in the description. If it's not yet ready, it will take you to my blog. Leave your name and your email address and we will reach out to you as soon as it's ready. You're also going to want to check out the Facebook group for discussion, taking a look at different images from different lenses and more announcements about training videos for the X-H2. Thank you so much for watching this video to the end. Again, I am Michael Andrew, also known as Michael Maven. I'm thrilled to have been your instructor. Have a great day and I can't wait to see you on the Facebook group.